to pull on the anointing pull on the anointing tonight look at somebody say i'm ready for a word tonight because i came loaded to give you a word god is shifting things he's moving things around this is your your year of divine alignment and it's not church as usual so you've got to change the way you see things change the way you think about things even here at without walls uh you're saying what's happening the kingdom of god's happening and that is that god's bringing forth a team of the full five fold ministry gifting so you will be fully equipped that apostolically prophetically pastorally evangelist teacher all fivefold ministry gifts will operate function fully that you will be who God's ordained for you to be. Can you see yourself walking out the greatness of God? Wouldn't it be a shame to have uh, existed and never really lived out the will of God? What a shame to just exist and never see the fullness of what God has for us. So the question becomes, how do we not miss our God moment? In order to not miss a God moment, you have to discern a God moment. Get out your Bibles, get out your notebooks, because I'm going to teach you, and then I'm going to probably lay hands on everything that moves. Is that good? Somebody say, bring it on, bring it on. Say, I'm ready, I'm ready. So in order not to miss a God moment, you have to discern a God moment. So you have to know when God is up to something. And whenever God's doing something, it looks different. It looks distinct. Go with me to Nehemiah chapter 1. Uh, part of that, as Pastor Michael began to teach, is that you have to have a spirit of discernment. You have to be able to know, have to be able to hear. There's no way that you can be tuned in and connected except through the power of prayer. No way. You, you have to be a person of prayer. Uh, this end time move of God will come through prophetic intercession and through people who know how to download heaven and see it manifest in the earth. Thy will be done, where guys? In the earth, as it is where? In heaven. So thy will be done, come into compliance. How many of you want the determination, decree, and declaration of God that there's a forced compliance in your life? So in order for that to happen, thy will be done in the earth, a forced compliance, then we have to know what it is to superimpose heaven into this earthly realm how do we see God's will come to pass is it God's will for you to be healed yes is it God's will for you to prosper and that's not just finances is it God's will for your family members to be saved is it God's will to see this community shaken for the Lord Jesus Christ yes is it God's will for the kingdom of God his royalty rule and realm to come to pass in earth yes right we know those things for us to develop fully is it God's will for you to walk at your destiny all the good things God has good things for us so the reality is why aren't we seeing the will of God come to pass God has done his part when Jesus said it is finished it meant it is completely complete Kathleen he did it he, he doesn't have to do anymore somebody's waiting on God to do a new thing but he did everything the, the question becomes how do I appropriate and tap into and see it come to pass remember when Jesus went to Canaan and he was doing his first miracle and he said to his mother it's not my time woman and what he was saying it's not my kairos and kairos is that time that it's a God moment it's where God's sovereignty meets up with man's destiny and he was saying it's not my kairos and she turns around and says whatever he saith, do it and the word literally means uh, to force eternity to manifest in an earthly realm so how do we force because God who sits in an eternal place outside of time and space has put eternity on the inside of us past Paul is preaching deep already he's put eternity on the inside of us the kingdom of God is where it's not external it's within you how do I manifest a God moment how do I manifest a God promise that really becomes the question now you've got a, something to ask yourself do you want to live weak defeated do you want to live underneath the covenant privileges you can make it to heaven but you're going to be all beat up or do you want to live victorious and know how to legally engage do you want to know that this book is a legal binding contract there's legislation do I know how to walk in the legislation do I know my rights do I know who I am what I'm entitled to do and how to bring that to pass somebody say teach me pastor Paula teach me let's stand up and go to Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 11 because we already know that for over 90 years the Jews have tried to rebuild the walls and they cannot do it they can't accomplish it how many of you need something rebuilt in your life 
restored in your life. Anybody need restoration back again? And back again is not just simply coming back before the event. It's back to the original authenticity of your core. How many of you need to come in divine alignment with who God created you to be? It means when you walk down the streets, people should be getting healed. When you walk down the streets, you should be walking with such the mind of Christ and in such gifting of keen discernment and spiritual accuracy that you have words of wisdom, words of knowledge. That's not just reserved for Pastor Mike old pastor paula that's for every believer you should have joy love peace goodness meekness temperance come on you should have the indwelling of the holy spirit operating and functioning in you that god in you working through you should be making a difference and manifesting itself everywhere when you wake up an alarm should go off in hell that says oh no they're up again the devil should be throwing everything he can to stop you because you are a threat to the kingdom of darkness because you are a light come on you are light so if we could put on our spiritual binoculars and I can see you in the spirit I'm either going to see dark or I'm going to see light period you're going to be a shadow or you're going to be light and the moment you represent light the enemy hates because he sees what's in you that is Christ in you showing through you so when you can see how bright you shine and some of your capacities are so large that the light can light up this entire community come on this light can light up the whole state and nations you are light for the Lord Jesus Christ so when you get up, that means that demonic spirits tremble at the fact that you're walking in the will of God. The devil is a liar. So Nehemiah sees this situation because of the sins of his forefathers. Some of the things that we face are not even our fault, but we have to take responsibility of their condition. And because of the decisions of former generations, they are now faced with consequences. And Nehemiah doesn't complain and he doesn't blame. He does something about it. Look at somebody, say, stop complaining. I'm talking to the row behind me. And say, stop blaming. <laughs> say, we know we're talking to the row behind us. Say, but we need to do something about it. We need to do something about it. So you already know what happens that, that Nehemiah is the son of Hakaliah. And it comes to pass. He's in Shusham. And his brother comes and gives him the report that the Jews had escaped. That's the remnant. And they said, the remnant that's left, verse uh, 3, in captivity or in great affliction and reproach, because the walls broken down and the gates are burned thereof. And it came to pass when I heard these words, verse 4, pick up with me. And it came to pass when I heard these words that he did what? I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Now, don't miss this because before he's going to prepare, before he strategizes, before he accomplishes anything in 52 days, he's going to pray for four months because Nehemiah is not going to make one move without knowing what heaven has to say about it. He's going to move in a realm of spirit. And that's the problem sometimes. Let me tell you something. This is not, church is not like any institution. This is not another corporation. This is not a, this is not a business. Business. this is the church it belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ it's not been purchased with silver and gold it's been purchased by the blood of Jesus this is not like any other place this is his church somebody say amen and so you can't engage with natural tactics. You've got to engage with spiritual things. You can use your mind. You can be smart. But at the end of the day, the only way to secure victories is you've got to be, you are a spiritual person. And I'm not going to let you sit back and, and draw conclusions and try to operate with natural means. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stir some things up in you right now because there needs to be an aggressiveness in your spirit that recognizes that the difference between life and death and the victories that you win in your life and in the lives of those around you and in this community is not fault in the natural for our weapons or warfare are not carnal but they're mighty to the pulling down of strongholds you're dealing with a real devil who really does hate you and wants to kill still and destroy you are either gather or you are scatter come on you are light or you're darkness you're being used by God or you're being used by the enemy you're either on God's agenda or you're on the devil's agenda there's really not any gray ground in this thing. You are for God. We taught it before. Or you are against God. And good people can be influenced by bad spirits. We perish because of lack of knowledge. Look at somebody say, you're not going to stay stupid the rest of your life. Say, she's talking to that row behind you again. Amen. So he prays. Somebody say he prays. And he fasts. Now watch what he says. And he said, I beseech thee. Can I get your attention? He says, hey! 
That's what beseeches. And I teach because whenever, Lincoln, you see that word, it's not just, hey, listen up. It means pay attention. Pay attention. So I want to emphasize what God, he says, O oh Lord God of heaven, thy great and terrible God. And the word literally means reverence to fear. That keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Who does he keep covenant with, guys? Who's he keep covenant with? People who love him and people who observe his commandments. So, so we think that we're just entitled to all the blessing and benefit of God. No, God keeps covenant with people who love him and people who obey his commandments. So I've gone, I'm teaching you better than you're saying amen already. Verse 6, let thine ear now be attentive and thy eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant which I pray thee before thee now day and night. So he doesn't cease praying. Uh, part of the problem is we think when we get an answer or a little breakthrough, we can stop doing what we did. Now, one of the reasons Without Walls and many other ministries went through what they went through is because we didn't have anything to get to the place that God took us. But sometimes in life when you get comfortable, you stop praying with the aggressiveness and the fervency. You can't ever stop or back down just because you've got a little bit of money in the bank or you got your Boaz now, you don't stop praying. Just because you got healed, you don't stop praying. Thing. The righteous, um, the prayer of the righteous availeth much. And it literally means the active operative prayer has much strength, force, and ability. Your prayer has to be active and it has to be operative for it to have force and ability and power. We can't play church. We have to be the church. And so we have to use what God has given us. And Wesley says, it seems like God's limited. He's not. But he wasn't, won't do anything unless somebody asks for it. We bring God's will to pass through the power of prayer. So he says, hear your, my servant, which I pray thee day and night for the children of Israel thy servants and confess the sins of the children of Israel he said I'm not just praying I'm not just interceding but I'm repenting on every but most of us talk about everybody instead of repent for everybody he's saying father forgive me and forgive forgive all these crazy folk around me he said we just we we've missed it that's what he's saying where he's repenting before it and he includes himself and if you look at Nehemiah's resume it's spotless he has no reason but he doesn't stand in some self-righteous attitude like, hey, I don't have to repent, you do. He's falling before his face saying, God, we missed it. We messed up because these walls would not be broke down had we maintained our guard. I'm going to teach you something deep tonight because we always want to blame the pastor and the ministry gift, but you're going to find the prayer of responsibility in building the wall is much more on the people than it is on the pulpit ministry. This is about vision. There are some things that leadership has certain immunity to according to the word of God. Don't make me start preaching preaching this early. Why do you think that Miriam got leprosy, but Aaron didn't? And they both did the same thing because he had on a priestly garment. So he had immunity because of an office and the people have a responsibility that I'm going to show you through the word of God to bring to pass the will of God. It's not just up to pastor Paula. It's not just up to pastor Michael. It's up to us as a people to bring it forth. If we're not seeing God move, it's not because uh, of something simply not happening in this pulpit. All of us have a responsibility responsibility to enter into his gates with thanksgiving into his courts with praise come on we have a responsibility to bring our tithe in here we have a responsibility not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together we have a responsibility to tame our tongue we have a responsibility to walk in righteousness and holiness that the, this is the temple of God and if any man destroy it him will God destroy for the temple of God is holy we have a responsibility to forgive those who offend us pastors preaching good right now we have a responsibility so he says to us, he said, I, I ask that as I confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house have sinned. Verse 7, pick up. We have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which thou commandest thy servant Moses. He says, look, this thing goes way back. When you told Moses to tell us what to do, we didn't keep the rules. We disengaged from what you told us to do and there's consequences for our disobedience. Somebody say, keep bringing it, Pastor Paula. Remember, I beseech thee, thy word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, if you transgress, which is to manifest sin, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if you turn unto me, somebody say, thank God for his grace. If you turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, you've got to do what? 
turn, keep the commandments, and do them. Though there were of you cast unto the uttermost of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them into the place that I have chosen to set my name. Now these are the servants thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by the strong hand. O Lord, I beseech you, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper. And he says, look, so you've got to have two desires. Number one, you reverence him. Number two, you want to manifest covenant and ability and enablement to prosper and succeed. I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. Notice the very last thing he does is the prayer petition. Most of us start out by asking God for our needs. It's the very last thing Nehemiah does. The very last part of his prayer, because there's four quadrants to this, is he doesn't even begin to ask God for needs until he's already prayed many other things. There's been repentance. There's been the attributes of God. There's been acknowledgement. There's been renouncement. There's been all kind of thing before he begins to make beseeching requests of God and petitioning for, on behalf of his needs. Somebody look at your neighbor say, we're going to get it right. We're going to get it right. Turn to somebody you haven't talked to and say, God's going to show you something in the power of the supernatural and imposing the promises of God. Come on, say imposing the promises of God. Talk to that person. Say by prayer. Say bring it on, Lord. Bring it on. You can be seated. The role of intercessory prayer is vital and essential to the development of restoration and a spiritual awakening. We will never have spiritual awakening if we don't understand how to really pray. And I know that some of us think that that's a cuss word, but prayer is the foundation. When you start using words like foundation, can I teach you for about 30 minutes and then we'll have a move of God or 20 minutes I'll teach you? Can I teach you? When you start saying the word foundation, it means essential. It's basis. So without the foundation, we don't have a building, right? So prayer is a fundamental. It's a basis. It's an essential. It is the precursor for provision in our life. Many of us say, why don't we have things? But Psalm chapter 11, verse 3 said, if the foundations be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? So if our prayer life gets destroyed, then it says the righteous are in trouble. And so the enemy wants your prayer life. The enemy wants you to shut your mouth and not be able to intercede or have intimacy or see the will of God to come to pass in your life. Without prayer, there will not be power in your life and provision in your life. I often say that publicly you are only as strong as you are privately. And so you can fake it for a little bit of time. But sooner or later, that facade's going to show because the true strength, come on, when you get under pressure, what's in you is going to really come out of you. We know that we govern nations on our knees, that we see things come to pass. And we'll find that, that the conditions for all successful work throughout God's word, all the time where you see something succeed or something come to pass, or, or to, to pray, to plan, to persevere. But there's no manifestation. Jesus couldn't go through the fullness of what he was about to endure to reconcile the family of God to, to what his purpose on earth was. He couldn't even face the cross with without first going to the Garden of Gethsemane, which was the place of consecrated prayer. So Nehemiah shows us, and his name is a type and shout of the Holy Spirit. He is a man of prayer. He is a person of prayer. You should write really big, I'm making a decision to be a person of prayer. If you have to set your alarm 10 minutes early, you're going to make up your mind, I'm going to get up and do something about my situation. I'm going to do something about the condition of my family, of my church. I'm not, I'm not going to sit around and just look at it and complain, but I'm going to get in the presence of God and begin to pray about it. I have a responsibility. Nehemiah opens in chapter one with prayer, but he doesn't just start there with prayer. He continues with prayer. And that's what's so important because Corinne, we start things and we see the birthing, the effectiveness with prayer, but we forget to carry them all the way to the end with prayer. So it's in Nehemiah chapter two and Nehemiah chapter four and Nehemiah chapter five and Nehemiah chapter six and Nehemiah chapter 14 or, or 13. You see it all the way through to the very end. He starts with prayer and he concludes with prayer. And he says in verse 4, we made our prayer and we set our watch. He prayed like it was all up to God, but he worked like it was all up to him. So you've got to have a tenacity, like you're going to pray that it's all up to God. Prayer changes everything. Look at somebody, say, you need something changed? Tell them, say, you need something changed? 
Say, prayer changes everything. I could shut the Bible and go home right there because prayer changes everything. It might sound old-fashioned, but we've gotten away from falling on our face. We've gotten so high-tech that we've forgotten what it is to get into the Holy of Holies and into the bedchamber and into the intimate place with the Spirit of God to see the will of God come to pass. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, we know it well. If my people, how many of us are his people? Come on, if my people which are called by my name. Anybody in the house know they're called by God's name. Shall do what? Humble themselves. And do what after you humble yourself? And pray. So the first thing for prayer is you've got to lower yourself, which is what humility is. You can't just stand in this kind of position. You've got to get down low. There's some low places that you have to go in order to see change come to pass in your life. If my people will humble themselves and not stand up in their own arrogance about what about them and what's their right, but if they'll humble themselves and pray and seek, and the word seek has a has a lot to do because it, it, it literally means to search out with diligence. It's like you're looking for something. It's like if there was a little quarter diamond somewhere on the stage and I looked through everything to find it and I dug up and I tore up everything. You've got to search out God diligently. We think that, that God's just going to fall on us. God's looking for somebody to pursue him, to search him out diligently if they'll seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. So it's not just searching him out diligently, but it means I've got to do something. I've got to make a decision that anything in my life that is displeasing to you, God, anything in my life that is separating me, anything in my life that, that, that is causing me to live in an outer realm, I'm going to make a decision to push the leap button. I'm going to repent, which means I change my mind and I change my ways. I change my direction. Some of you need to delete some numbers out of your phone tonight. You need to delete some memories out of your mind tonight. Come on. You need to delete some attitudes out of your soul tonight. You've got to delete some things. You've got to make a decision until you're going to cut some things out. If they'll humble and if they will seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then there's the condition. Then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. God says, I'll hear you. I'll forgive you and I'll heal you once you begin to do this. So the initiation of purpose starts with prayer. Nothing can be accomplished without laying the foundation of praying it through. We all want to walk a purpose-filled life, right? We all want to live a purpose-driven life. But you don't get to live out your purpose until you become a person of prayer. Because you aren't going to see God's power and see God's provision if you don't know what it is to really bring forth the will of God through the exercising of praying. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, you got to pray some things through. There are four components to this. Can I go through them real quick? Number one, the first thing is the affirmations or the attributes of God. Number two is supplication and confession in verse six and seven. Number three is intercession in light of God's word. That's the promises, verse eight through 11. And number four is petition for a favorable response from the king. That's verse 11. So God gives us a pattern for prayer. Details do make a difference. Details matter. Remember when the, the, the disciples came to Jesus and they did didn't ask him, teach us how to preach. They didn't ask him, teach us how to hermeneutically, homiletically dissect an exegesis a text so that we can have crowds like you. They didn't say, teach us how. To. They said, teach us. They saw the power on his life. They saw the revelation. They saw the illumination. And the disciples came to him, and they, of all things they could have asked him to teach and impart, they said, teach us how to pray. Because they knew that he was a man of power. They knew that he was a man of God's presence because they knew knew that he was a man of prayer. They knew that he knew how to get heaven's attention and see angels dispatched and see the supernatural manifestation. They knew that demons trembled. They knew that the sick got healed. They knew that the blind eyes got opened. They knew that the lame began to walk. They knew that, the, that he taught with wisdom that was from another realm and not out of his own mouth or his own knowledge. They understood that because they knew that Jesus was a man of prayer. Somebody say, Teach us how to pray, Lord. Teach us. 
So a pattern is an order. It's an arrangement of things. It's a model or design for which copies can be made. And we know that when Jesus gives them the pattern of prayer, Nehemiah is the foreshadow or the type and shadow of what Jesus is going to lay out as well. He, he was, as we implement the, the pattern of how Jesus taught to pray, Nehemiah's prayer, we start the process of restoration and rebuilding and seeing things come to pass because prayer has power to change things. I already said, Wesley said it seems like God's limited he does nothing unless somebody asks for it so while we know God can act intelligently through sovereignty it's as if he can do whatever he wants whenever he wants with whoever he wants but we are reminded in James chapter 5 verse 16 so you understand what I just said God can act intelligently through his sovereignty meaning he's God he can do whatever he wants whenever come on and help me out are you with me God can act intelligently Intelligently, you're with me. God can because He's God. He could do anything. Can I can I help you with something? He could do anything. He's God. He can create. He can do anything. But God cannot violate His own legal th entities. So what I'm saying to you right there, even though intelligently we understand and comprehend that He's sovereign and He can do anything, He set up certain legislation. Because He set up legislation, God cannot violate His own word. That's why. He he needed the womb of a woman to enter into into the world that's why we call him incarnate he had to come through flesh because when spirits move spirits don't just show up they have to use things they have to use humans they can use elements they can use animals so spirits don't just show up they have to use things God doesn't violate his word so though he is God and is sovereign and intelligently we know he can do whatever he wants whenever he wants however he wants he doesn't violate in James chapter 5 verse 16 says the effectual fervent which means active operative prayer of the righteous man availeth has force power and strength much so in other words if we want to see the force the power and the ability of God in our life then we have to have an active operative prayer although God can do and God can can do whatever he wants whenever he wants with whoever he wants he doesn't do unless somebody has an active operative prayer life that releases the strength the ability and the force if you want to see your church become forceful if you want to see your life become forceful if you want to see your finances and your family become forceful come on if you want to see your, your your purpose and your ministry become forceful and if you want strength then you've got to open your mouth fall on your face humble yourself turn from your wicked ways and begin to pray we can cannot see God's will come to pass without the power of prayer. Somebody say, teach us, Pastor Paula, teach us. God desires and uses prayer as his vehicle to bring his will to pass. And so in the case of Nehemiah, it was for restoration and rebuilding. Prayer, we know, is personal communication with God. It is the intercourse of the soul. It's not contemplation or just meditation, but it's an direct address to God. It's intimacy of the soul. It is the beseeching of the Lord, Exodus chapter 32, verse 11. It's the pouring out of the soul to the Lord, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 15. It's praying and crying to heaven, 2 Chronicles chapter 32. It's seeking God and making supplication, Job chapter 8, verse 5. It's drawing near to God, according to Psalm chapter 73, verse 28. So God wants to talk with you. He wants intimate partnership. He wants intimate relationship. This is not about what we want. God has set this up to get what he wants. Make me a sanctuary, a sacred holy place that I can dwell. I can have habitation. God doesn't just want you to come in and get your Sunday fix. God wants intimacy with you. He wants you living in a clear channel he wants to be closer to you than any other person no man owns you God owns you everybody else that gets to share in the privilege of partaking in any aspect of your life it is just that a privilege your spouse doesn't own you your children don't own you your boss doesn't own you your pastor doesn't own you you're owned by God you were created by God your own lease
us here to earth and anybody else that gets to partake in the privilege of your life it is just that it's not it's a privilege not an entitlement you owe no man nothing but love everybody should celebrate the gifting that they they are privileged to the fact that they get to partake in the presence of who you are because you are a gift to this world and when you recognize that you shift your mentality you don't go where you're just tolerated you go where you're celebrated you don't hang out with fools that don't have discernment to recognize I've got 70 short years if you can't understand what is on the inside of this this package and this vehicle of expression and appreciate the gifting of God which is the core of the authenticity of my being then, then I'm sorry I can't hang with you I'll minister to you all day long but this is valuable and and, and to a greater degree beside the own DNA of God establishing the handiwork and fabrication of who I am as far as persona his spirit is on the inside of me that's why the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead now dwells and lives within me that that spirit that has life that spirit that has power that spirit that has the ability to break every bondage of darkness that spirit that the devil hates because he's intimidated listen you better hear me because the enemy is nothing but a great deceiver he deceives you he works through the spirit of deception revelation chapter 12 verse 9 this serve it says this great dragon which was the serpent of old who deceives many nations he works through intimidation manipulation and domination anything that intimidates manipulates or dominates your life is not of God God is a liberating God God's a freeing God so anything that comes to bring you into deception intimidates you manipulates you and dominates you it's called a spirit of Jezebel but you're not a weak Christian because you sit under a five-fold ministry that you get well taught the word of God because if you want a spiritual awakening and not to play church you have enough discernment to understand this is of God that might look like God but it, it's not because I don't see in the natural I see in the spirit so I'm not looking I could care less what clothes you wear what car you drive who you date who's on your arm how fancy your talk is what you look like because I don't even see you on the outside I either see light on the inside and it depends on how bright that light is or I see darkness this is pretty simple I see what spirit is operating in you and the only way I have the ability to do that is because I know what it is to get in a holy place called the secret place because I don't play church and go just download somebody's sermon and try to get somebody's idea I get in intimate chambers with God and know what it is to hear heaven's conversation that tells me shows me come on you better look at somebody that's that's how you know who you are say tell somebody say you got to start praying baby you got to start praying I'm gonna go there anyway so God wants intimacy the moment you start praying angels get activated the moment you start praying God goes to work the moment you start praying heaven's holding conversation and downloading it to your spirit the moment you start praying the invisible becomes visible the moment you start praying you start breaking things in the spirit you start loosing things you start binding things you start breaking things you start bringing and birthing things none of it comes to pass without prayer we're saying awaken us we don't get awakened because we have talent and gifting that stands here look they're gonna pack out the forum for all the concerts with more people than we could pack out with every church in this city come on and help me out and, and they are not anointed they're just talented talented talent does not bring you into the presence of God you better hear what I'm saying anointing brings you into that so let's just close shop and go have fun I'm not interested in it I'm interested in God's presence I'm interested in God's power I'm interested in God's provision somebody say you got to pray you've got to pray because the only thing that brings that strength that force that ability is the active operative prayer of somebody that is in relationship with God if it's going to be it's up to you it's not just up to Pastor Michael it's not just up to me you want your family free start praying you want to be free start praying you want to get rid of the Boaz and get your Boaz start praying come on you want to get you better I mean your Bobo come on Bozo whatever it is that you're with right now you need him out of your life come on I need your Boaz to start praying <laughs> pastor Paul is teaching good anyway so attributes Nehemiah starts affirming things because prayer presupposes the belief in the personality of God 
You can't have a, prayer la prayer, a true, pure prayer language without understanding who God is. And prayer presupposes the belief in the personality of God. It's the ability and the willingness to hold intimacy with us. His personal control of all things and all his creation. Nehemiah declares, O Lord God of heaven. And he declares the title of God nine times. Ezra does it ten times in the post-exilic books. In other words, it's the same thing. It points to the sovereignty of God. So the first, it, it means the absolute right to all things according to his own good pleasure. That he has unlimited power and control of all things. He's the one who made heaven. He's the one who reigns in heaven. He's the one who is in heaven. It's the same as in Matthew 6, 9, teach us to pray. And the first thing they say, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. See, I, it's going to be hard to get past this point. Hallowed be thy name. Our Father which art in heaven is the attribute of the same as sovereign God, hallowed, holy. That's why if you get in the presence of God, it's hard to do anything beyond getting, listen, you can spend years just in the presence of God with the attributes because once you really hit that place, Chris, you know what I'm talking about. You hit that place. You tap into a realm in the spirit and you hear the angels around the throne saying, holy, 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 Lord God almighty, holy, holy. And all they've done all throughout eternity holy holy and why would these angels do nothing but holy holy because every time they circle the throne of God they see a dimension of God they've never seen before and all they can say is holy 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 Lord God Almighty holy 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 Lord God Almighty who is and who is to come and they just begin to talk the attributes of God and he goes on to say that great and terrible God and terrible doesn't mean like bad and means reverence is the Hebraic word and reverence is a respect that is felt and seen so he's saying sovereign God who I respect and respect is not just something that you say you know respect give me some R-E-S-P-C-T is something that is felt and seen you know that you don't have respect because he treats you like a dog she treats you like a like a no, please don't make me get into the stuff okay respect is something that is felt respect is something that is seen respect is not what you say to me respect is an action it's verb it's what you do don't say you love God and then you talk about your brother it says the love of God is not in you that you're a liar don't say you love God and don't bring his tithe to the storehouse it says you're a robber don't say you love God and not not do the things that God tells us and commands us so it continues that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments he's referring back to Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 9 and he says, know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He's a faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commands. So the affirmation of attributes is an honor and respect for who God is. And although we approach God confidently, we don't do so casually. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 and 29. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. What are we receiving, guys? A kingdom that can, what? Not be shaken. Let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and all. It's what Chris was talking about. I don't get it. I don't get how we can come in and just be so casual about the things of God and be so careless about it. When we've received a kingdom that cannot be shaken, I've been grafted into a new family. I've been made a new creation. I deserved hell, but I received heaven. I deserve to live in a trailer on Bill Moxley Road the rest of my life. But God allowed me to preach the gospel to the world. I deserve to lose my mind and should have. I deserve to be buried six feet under and should have. But God preserved me, protected me, and gave me the mind of Christ. God changed the way I saw things. I deserve to be abusive and hurtful to myself. Because the way I was born and formed by my childhood and the things that molded me. But God changed me into a new creation that I understood that I was fearfully and wonderfully created. I deserve to be rejected, but I was made accepted. I deserve punishment, but I received freedom. And he says, you should be thankful because what you got cannot be taken from you. The kingdom, which is the royalty realm and rule of God, cannot be taken. It won't be shaken. It is forever to those who recognize that they are sons and daughters of the Most High God, that you're in this world, but you're not of this world. And the kingdom 
can be taken. You can take a lot from me. You can talk about me. You can lie on me. You can try to stone me, kill me, but you can't take the kingdom which God has established to give me, and it includes every promise of possession. So, so no matter whether you believe in me, whether you think I'm qualified by my resume, whether you think I should wear leggings or not wear leggings, whether you like my boots or don't, whether you think I should preach or not because I'm female, whether you're mad at me or you're not mad at me, it really doesn't matter because the kingdom cannot be shaken, which I received not by you. Thank God that no man gave me what can't be shaken, but I received it by my elder brother, Jesus Christ, who willed it to me because of a heavenly father that loves me with a love that is unconditional and accepts me and because it cannot be shaken. You better be glad that a, a lot can be shaken in your life, but the kingdom cannot be shaken. You better be thanking God right now. So therefore, whenever I recognize that what God gave me can never be taken from me, you can take things away from me. But what God gave me, that's why if something's really of God, it's not going to leave me. Because what's part of your destiny, you can't lose it. What's not, come on, you can't keep it. So what God really, and I didn't manipulate my way into, somebody better help me. You better thank God for some of the things that loosed your life. Because some of the things didn't belong in your life. And God's sending in the authentic of what should be in your life. The kingdom cannot be shaken. You can't take my call. You can't take my core. You can't take my peace. You can't take my joy. You can't take my love. You can't take my goodness. You can't take the Holy Spirit. You can't take my salvation. You can't take my justification. You can't take my sanctification. You can't make me mad. You can't take my possession. You can't take the kingdom because it can't be shaken because in him I live and I move and I have my being. So therefore, I don't come in here to play church. I came in here with a grateful heart of thanksgiving because I don't come in here arrogantly, but I come in here confidently because I know what he did and he did it for me and I don't understand it, but I receive it. So God, I thank you. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your holiness. I thank you for your righteousness. Come on, I worship you. There is none like you, oh God. And that's how Nehemiah starts. I don't even have time to finish it. I'll teach you the rest after the conference because we'll keep teaching this. But Nehemiah recognizes and understands, God, I am grateful for everything. You are God and God alone. And before I start asking you for favor with the king, before I start asking you to grant me a petition, before I start putting my wish list before you, I just want to say thank you, God. I'm grateful for who you are. And I don't know if Nehemiah spent three months and 20 days just thanking God. And then on that last two days started asking God. But I can tell you the most part of this prayer had to just be because when you get in God's presence and really begin to thank him and give him attributes and give him acknowledgement of who he is, you can't help it because the realization of a holy, living, wonderful, majestic, marvelous, royal, uh, graceful, amazing God that loves you unconditionally and receives you and accepts you as you are that you've been accepted in the beloved that picked you up out of a pit and put your feet on a solid rock that pulled you out of the dung hill and set you before the princes even the princes of his people which means the high people of influence that means that you have been set before influencing people it means there are spirits that like you not just spirits that hate you and God pulled you out don't make me etymologize dung God pulled you out of crap and set you before greatness my God what kind of God is that so I'm sorry but uh, Dr. Mark you play more you're one of the best most anointed players but you don't have to play me into praise you don't have to push me into saying I love you Lord Chris there's an anointing on you B you can belt it but now y'all don't have to do it I can't sing a note at all I don't know how to but I can I can praise him I'll out praise him I'll out worship him because it's not my talent it's my love that says God you are holy you are righteous
gracious, you're wonderful, you're marvelous, you're majestic, there's none like you. And when I think about the privilege to be in your presence, what an awesome God. I should be so hateful right now. I should be full of malice and envy and bitterness and anger and rage, but somehow you broke all of that off me. I kept falling on my face. I just kept saying, God, do something, use me. I humble myself because I recognize without you I'm nothing, oh God. I need you and I love you and I worship you. And he kept changing me. And Nehemiah ultimately becomes the answer to his own prayer because that's the power of a person who praises or in a person who prays. The, the very thing you're praying for is the highest order of anything is to become it. The spiritual awakening you're praying for, you become it. It happens within you. The provision you're praying for, you become it. And you recognize the kingdom of God is within me and cannot be taken from me. You better help me out in the name of Jesus. Hey! Come on and stop praying. Come on, open your mouth right here. Begin to activate that. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. Out of my heart, praise. Out of my heart, worship. My soul loves you. My soul loves you, Jesus. My soul loves you, Jesus. I worship, I worship, I worship. I give you praise. I give you praise. I give you praise. I give you praise. I can never love. Jesus, I love you. I love you. I love you. My soul says thank you. Says thank you. Says thank you. Says thank you. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Deep cries out to deep. Deep cries out to deep. Deep cries out to deep. My soul loves you, Jesus. My soul loves you, Jesus. Come on, release it. Release it from your spirit. Release it from your heart. And oh, my soul cries out. My soul cries out, and no, my soul cries out for the living God, for the living God, and no, my soul cries out, and no, my soul cries out, and no, my soul cries out for the living God, for the living God, and no, my soul cries out, yeah. Come on and worship. Lift your hands and just start praying in the spirit. Just start praying in the spirit. If you're here tonight, here's what I feel. If you're here tonight and you're very weary, you're just weary, you're weary, you're weary, you just, you, you're bland right now. Um, I need to deal with some things in the spirit, but there's a weariness, there's a heaviness on you. you say, Pastor Paul, that's me. Lift your hand. Come down here. God's going to break it. Start praying in the spirit. Pastor Michael, forgive me some anointing on. Start praying in the spirit. Come on, we're going to move with the things of God. Now I need you to start praying like this is your father, this is your mother, it's your best friend. Watch. Keep 
praying in the spirit, but I want you to hear something. Psalm chapter two, verse one says, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers, and this is talking about principalities, take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh, and the Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion, and I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, and this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with the rod of iron, and thou shalt dash them in pieces with the potter's vessel. Listen, he said, here's why they come after you, because you're anointed, because you're anointed. And he said, they take counsel against those that are anointed. The principalities, rulers take counsel. That's why, listen, more than anything, you pray for your pastors. You pray. We pray for each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, because principalities take counsel against those that are anointed. He said, why do the heat and the range and the people imagine vain things? He said, there's counsel against them. But he said, here's what's going to happen. He said, you're going to give them to us for our inheritance. And we're going to shatter them as with iron. Whatever it is, because every demonic spirit has a personality that has come against you to wear you down and to tire you, that you're just fatigued, that you, you've lost your joy, which is your strength, that you can't go to that place and press in. The moment hands are laid on you, I believe it's going to be broken off you in the name of Jesus. And that it's, it's in the realm of the spirit. I need you to start praying in the spirit, guys. Come on, I need you to start praying in the spirit. Because I'm doing some battle right now for the lives. I'm battling. There's people up here that are suicidal. They, they, there's literally, I see, like, they, there's just such a, they've been zapped. It's like they're under a heavy spirit of oppression. But God says, God said that counsel that has been set against you because of what you've been called to do and who you've been called to be in this earth, that it's going to be, he said, ask of me. Now tonight you're going to ask God for your deliverance. You're going to ask God to give you freedom. You're going to ask God to break the spirit. Listen, there's a spirit that is causing you just to lose your sense of pleasure. You're just worn down, but the devil is a liar. And I'm, I'm going to pray that there's going to be a renewing, that you're going to mount up with wings as eagles. The reason it says you mount up, you go to the ascending place, the reason it compares you to an eagle, because an eagle goes to aptitudes that no other animal can go to. It goes to a height and a place that no other creature can go to. And an eagle is known to be able to take its enemy and put it in its mouth. And it takes it up so high that that other creature that it has in its mouth suffocates because of lack of oxygen. Because the other creature cannot stand that kind of atmosphere. You're going to mount up. You're going to go to an ascended place. It says, ask of me and I'm going to give you this. Whatever the council has that in the spirit realm has been sent against you to pull down your strength, to destroy you, to make you a laughing mock. To, to make you a mockery to the Lord Jesus. It's going to be broke right now because you're going to ask God for your divine escape. Come on. You're going to ask and it says that they're going to be shattered. They're not going to just, they're going to be shattered. Can you see it? Can you see the shattering of it right now in the name of Jesus? I, I need to, y'all start praying in the spirit. Listen, I'm, I can get back in my car and drive right now, but I believe in the difference between life and death right now and between world changers being able to take their position with the strength and to release them into their place. If you could see, I need some help. It says, ask. You start praying for their deliverance like it was your deliverance. You start praying and it says, ask of me and I'm gonna give it to you for your inheritance and I'm gonna shatter that spirit like that iron and the, you're about to mount up tonight and you're gonna go to a high place and the high place you're gonna go to is a presence that the enemy cannot go. 
Job said, I'm sitting in sackcloth and ashes. I've lost my family. I've lost my money. But there is a path. There is a vein. There's a place that I'm going to that no young lion, no adder, no whelp can touch me. I know that place. It's a place in Christ. It's a place called the ascended place that you step up and you step forward. You're about to be mounted to a high place in Christ. I believe when hands are laid on you, there's going to be a shattering of every demonic spirit. Come on, y'all start praying, start clapping, start releasing right now. Start doing some warfare for your brothers and sisters in the spirit. Pastor Michael, we're my ministers, my crew ministers. Corinne, get up here, I need you. Let me start laying hands. Come up here, come up here. Let me pray. Come here, I need to anoint your hands. To go off. Come on, I need some of y'all praying. Start praying, praying, pray. Rachel, you worshiping? Come on, I need you praying. I need you praying. Come on, start praying. Come, start praying. My soul says yes, oh. My soul says yes to you, Lord. Yes to your deliverance. Yes to your freedom. Yes to your way. My soul says yes. Come on, Pastor Michael, start laying hands on people. Get up here and sing. We say thank you, Jesus. All my hands are Every right chain on. be destroyed. Every chain be destroyed. We can take control of the atmosphere. We take control of the atmosphere. Oppression has to 